uh, we'll start with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you so very much for giving us this time, Lord, that we brothers and sisters could gather through this platform and to encourage one another, strengthen one another through your scripture, Lord. The time we are going to spend in the study of your word, Lord, may be a time that benefits our spirits and our relationship with you, Lord. As Shanti is going to teach us this is evening, Lord, I pray for your special anointing upon her and we ask you to speak through her so that we may we all of us who have who come who came here to hear and learn lord may be ministered by your spirit and uh, lead us in our discussions the discussions we make may bring glory to your name thank you very much for everything we submit the uh, the hour we are going to spend in meditation of your word and in your presence may bring glory to your name in jesus name we pray amen amen so uh, good evening to you all. This uh, Bible study is uh, yeah, definitely a special Bible study, we have to say. We have another teacher introduced uh, to our team. Uh, till now, you were listening from Pastor Dan, Pastor Sachin and me, and sometimes uh, from Franklin. Now we have a new, new Bible teacher also added to us. So first of all, why don't we join our hands and welcome uh, Shanti for taking uh, this opportunity to share the word of God with us. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's wonderful and we are looking forward for more people to join and uh, it is such a wonderful step, Shanti, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate it and I wish you all the best and definitely I'm sure that God is going to minister through uh, through what you share. Uh, over to Shanti. Well, thank you so much, uh, Praveen, uh, for, for that introduction. I, it's very humbling to hear that. And uh, but I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I know I have uh, addressed you all on the Sundays, uh, but this is the first time that I would be uh, actually uh, meeting with you guys and learning together a Bible study in GCI. So uh, this is something new for me as well. And so uh, I really pray and uh, I know that the Lord will uh, help us all, uh, you know, go through his word and according to his wisdom to be able to learn something new. Uh, about another interesting facet of the Lord. So, uh, Praveen, is it okay if I share my screen right now? Uh, can you all see my screen? All right. Wonderful. Okay. So, as uh, it's titled, uh, the study today is about all about understanding prophecy, and we will be doing it in two parts uh, because it's such a vast subject, and there's so much to learn about it. And uh, but I will start this uh, particular study with uh, a small short story. Okay, and the story goes like this: A boy performed surgery on a frog to understand how it could jump to such great heights. But in the process, he killed the frog and he learned nothing. But in other words, the boy did learn something, isn't it? Though the boy had the right motive, but without the right tools and understanding how to do the surgery or interpret the frog's internal organs and its complexities, the outcome would never be knowledge, would it? but the opposite of it. And so accordingly, when learning or trying to understand about prophecy, no one size fits all, okay? And so uh, this, uh, in the same way, no one explanation fits every aspect of this much debated, very interesting, and sometimes controversial spiritual gift. But hopefully God will help us with his wisdom and discernment to use the right tools and he will that he will give us the knowledge to understand the complexities of the spiritual gift. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, that we will learn in this study a really interesting facet of our Lord Jesus. So going ahead, why should we even bother to learn about this gift, isn't it? That is the one question that rings. We should learn about this gift because past prophecy proves that our God is all things about truth. For example, in Isaiah, we see the prophecy that a Messiah would come and redeem the world. And God fulfilled it after many, many years. 
when Jesus came. So in any biblical prophecy is a assurance that God is committed in fulfilling what he says in his appointed time. And so we need to remember this particular point and learn about this gift because there are many, many prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled and that are written in the book of Revelation. Also, initially, the way God communicated with uh, humans was direct. But when sin entered, this scenario changed, leading the way for intermediaries to bring the word of God to humanity. For example, the people of Israel were so scared of God's divine presence amongst them when he was, you know, over them as a pillar, as a cloud of, uh, as a cloud in the day and a pillar of fire in the night. Right. And so we see in Exodus 29, the people of Israel told Moses, you speak to us. We will listen, but don't let God directly speak to us. And so uh, this is why we need to learn about this gift. What is this gift about? OK, just a small note, a distinction between a prophet and a priest. Prophets speak to man on behalf of God. And a priest was someone who spoke on behalf of man to God on in, in those particular days. OK, so according to the Bible, that means the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see that we have received revelations or teachings from God to us. And there are three types of revelations that are noted in the scripture. Revelations given from God to man. The first one being law from priests. Now we see in Malachi 2.7 about this, that for the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge and from his mouth men should seek instruction. And in the second verse, Jeremiah 18.18, 18, we see the remaining two types of revelations. Second one being counsel from the wise. Third being word from the prophets. Now, as you see, there are some Bible references that are just given as references and some have been opened and kept for you to read them through. Uh, but please do, uh, if possible, I highly recommend that you take a screenshot of this uh, of the screen or go back to the link on the YouTube after so that you can have a deeper study by yourself uh, with the help of this study. Yeah. So if we, for today's sake, we will only be concerning ourselves with the third option, that is word from the, from the prophets as written in Jeremiah 1818. Now, what is prophecy? Prophecy is in simple terms, any God inspired message or a revelation as it's written in 2 Peter 1, 21. Now, why are these prophecies given by God? These are given to inspire an action or a change. And a prophet is someone who carries this very message or revelation uh, as a spokesperson or as an interpreter of God's word with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so for someone to be called as a prophet, there needs to be a calling by the Lord. One cannot self-title oneself as a prophet as we see many nowadays. Okay, so a best illustration of a prophet would be like a satellite. You know, it receives information and then it broadcasts where it's supposed to reach. Now, a prophet, which is plural, and prophets is nabi or nabim in Hebrew or uh, and in the language of Arabic. And uh, this comes from a root word in Greek, which is called as prophetuo, which means to speak before. And as we all know, a prophet is masculine. And we have many uh, examples in the Bible of uh, prophets like Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah. And the same would be for uh, a feminine gender. We have, we call them as prophetesses. And they, and some of the examples of prophetesses we have as uh, Deborah, Hulda, and Anna. Now let's move on and see how does one become a recipient of this gift? Now, the Holy Spirit, in his grace alone, chooses who to give this gift according to his will and purpose. For more information, I will uh, I will tell you to note this scripture down in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, which talks about concerning spiritual gifts. And please read through so that you may have more extra information and uh, an idea about what we are speaking. 
Secondly, this particular gift is not confined to a certain tribe, a family, or even a class of persons. For example, Elijah was a farmer. Moses was a prince. And so it's not automatically inherited as well. And no special preparation is needed or a particular core study to be done to receive this gift because it's completely under the purview of the Holy Spirit. We only need to accept Jesus as a personal savior and be born again and have a calling from the Lord himself for this role. That is how we can receive it. However, just a note of caution that in today's time, if you and I on this side of the cross were to be given a message by God, and if it's not spoken with love and compassion, emulating Jesus, our ultimate prophet and role model, then listeners may reject that message altogether. Secondly, pride on the part of the prophet or the prophetess will hinder the operating of this gift, especially if the prophet is demanding or has a discouraging spirit. Now let's go on forward by seeing the two sides of prophecy. One is called foretelling prophecy and second one is called as forth-telling prophecy. Now let's look at the first one which is foretelling prophecy. Now this is knowing the truth by revelation and not by analysis. Simply put, this is about telling things about the future. Example, uh, Isaiah chapter 40 onwards, we see that it is about foretelling prophecies. And many scholars believe that these chapter 40 and onwards have been written much after Isaiah's death. But, it then, but then it's very interesting that Isaiah foretold, uh, you know, who would one day be the king of Israel and who will set the people free. So basically foretelling is telling things about, uh, telling about things in the future or prophesying about things in the future. But it also sometimes reveals buried past. If we read in 2 Samuel 12, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 to 12, we see that prophet Nathan reveals to David what he did in regards to uh, Bathsheba. David never said that before. Nathan was the one who approaches King David and he prophesies and he talks about the buried past of David. And when it comes to this particular uh, topic of prophecy, most of us are expecting this foretelling, isn't it? That there will be prophecies or predictions about what is to come in the future. Now let's look at the uh, second side of prophecy, which is forth telling. This is a situational analysis of the present circumstances and with the help of discernment, and a godly understanding can predict what is to come. For example, in Amos 5, we see Prophet Amos is, uh, you know, issues a prophecy about social injustice. He talks about social injustice happening in the country at that point of time. And he warns about what is to come if the circumstances and people do not change. Isaiah chapters 1 to 39 also is a good example of both telling prophecies. In this particular side of prophecy, we also see there is an intersection or a crisscrossing uh, of teaching and prophecy. That means analyzing the situation ar around us and being inspired by God, sharing relevant teaching through the scriptures, meaning a godly message of what is to come. And this type of prophecies also we see throughout the Bible. Now let's move on from this to what is the means of reception of this gift of prophecy. Now there are many different ways. Some listed are in the way of symbolic images or visions. Okay. Secondly, the means of reception could be as Habakkuk the prophet put, as a burden of the Lord on his heart. Other prophets have received it in the way of a message or an oracle. Fourth, we see that even sight was used as a means of reception or as a seer from the word rah, from the verb to see. 
For example, in 1 Sam 9, 9, we see that when Saul, King Saul, you know, before he became king uh, and his servants, they were looking for their lost donkeys and they wanted to find out where they were. And so they talked about visiting the seer and the seer was no, none else than uh, Prophet Samuel. He was also known as a seer and you will read it. If you read it from 1 Samuel 9, 9, you'll have a better idea about this. An important note again to remember here is that divination is not prophecy in a biblical sense. Now, many of you might be wondering, what is this word? You know, some of you may have heard about divination and some of you might not have heard about it. But divination is just the practice of trying to predict future events or discover hidden knowledge without a calling for it. Okay, it is a worldly prophecy and has a different source of inspiration, not God. And sometimes people who practice divination can predict certain things correctly, but they always have a caveat that is attached. That means they have a condition to meet. They have a requirement that is to be met. And so not always with a good intention. So people who practice these, these divinations per se are called as diviners. Maybe some of them you've heard as soothsayers, clairvoyants, or even fortune tellers. We have many of them in India, don't we? And you know, palm readers and this and that. Um, so, you know, person like this, um, you know, a diviner uh, like this was Alvin Toffler. Alvin Toffler wrote a book called Future Shock. And he's not a Christian, but he analyzed the circumstances of today and he predicted a future and said that it will shock us. Well, there was nothing shocking about it because we hear many like Mr. Toffler, isn't it? I remember when Y2K was going on, you know, many people predicted uh, some of the prophets rose up and, you know, so-called prophets they rose up and they said, the world is coming to an end. This is the time that Jesus will come. And similarly, so many other prophets, self-titled prophets are saying now with the Israel and the Gaza conflict that this is the sign. This is it. This is the end somehow. And many are, uh, uh, you know, prophecies are in the in the air right now like that. But it is left for us to discern, to test each and every prophecy to see whether it is from God or is it a, from a divination. And so... Um, we will look at that definitely a little later, but just move, to move on, uh, prophecy became more popular during the monarchy of Israel in the course of political instability. Now, God raised prophets to speak on his behalf to the people and to the kings. And so we see many of them during the days of the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament. And during this time, we also saw many a prophetic literature or prophetic books being written, which are now in the Bible. So let's look at the circumstances in which prophecy thrived. The first being political instability. We will term it as the ABC crisis. Let's look at it from, uh, from uh, each angle. The crisis A was that Assyrian crisis to the northern kingdom of Israel, that is the 10 remaining tribes of, uh, of the, you know, when the, when the kingdom of when Israel split into two. So this was the northern kingdom. So we see that whenever the king led his people to sin, God kept sending prophets to warn them. Finally, they got conquered by the assurance. And all of this is, we all know this, and it is written in the biblical history in the Old Testament. And so when they got conquered by the assurance, the assurance very smartly would intermix the people of different nations that they have conquered in the same cities. And so Jews would be intermingle and intermarry with other kingdom people. And assurance used to do this so that their rule would not be questioned. And so the Jews married other people and thus the kingdom of Israel was lost in their identity and to history. But the people who came from this crisis later on were called as the Samaritans. Now we look at crisis B, which is to the southern kingdom of, the, of Judah. That means the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. It was in this time when this kingdom was finally conquered by the Babylonians. But God promised that one day they will come back 
God, uh, you know, sent a prophecy that they would one day come back to their own land. And Isaiah 40 onwards, which talks about foretelling, remember foretelling prophecies we talked about, we see that a prophecy is given that a king would arise who will release them. And this prophecy we see as being fulfilled when King Cyrus released them and let some of them go back into their own land to rebuild the cities and to rebuild the temple to worship God. Here we see prominently, you know, Prophet Ezra, Prophet Nehemiah giving a report of this. And crisis C was coming back from Babylon. We see prophets like Haggai, and Zechariah and other minor prophets were sent to warn and guide those who were coming back after the ruling given by King Cyrus on how to live the godly way, how to build back the house of the Lord. This was the first reason in which the prophecy thrived. Second circumstance was threat to the worship of Jehovah himself. We saw the, the rising of Baal and other idols, right? Took over the place of the true God. And so even in those circumstances, we saw that prophecy thrived. Third reason was the economic and social development in the regimes that were noted throughout the biblical times and where we saw the poor being oppressed very greatly. And so we see that, and we can safely say that prophecy operated as a need-driven thing. So where was the first time we see prophecy in the Bible? We see it when Abraham was counted as a prophet. In Genesis 27, King Abimelech is asked by God, his prophet, to be prayed for by Abraham when he takes, when he took Sarah as his own wife. Now, Abraham was counted as a prophet as a prophet by God, as God chose to reveal himself and with whom God initiated a holy covenant. But this, this is not normative at all, or this is not typical at all, because Abraham received a calling, yes, but it was to go to the promised land and form a nation to be a godly role model to the other nations around. Now, what would the normative be? You know, the normative would be to call Moses as a prophet, as we read in Deuteronomy 34, 10 to 12. It says, there has never again been a prophet in Israel like Moses. The Lord spoke face to face with him and sent him to perform powerful miracles in the presence of the king of Egypt and the entire nation. And no one else has ever had the power to do such great things as Moses did for everyone to see. And thus, Moses became the standard bearer for all prophets in the Old Testament. Now, let's look at the types of prophetic literature or prophetic books that are, that are there in the scripture. There are three kinds. We all know this autobiographical, where the prophet himself has written the message of uh, God. Biographical was someone under the prophet or other than the prophet writing the message that was received by the prophet from God. And third, as a way of sermons that are noted in scriptures and beyond. So different prophets and each of their messages were recorded in different ways. And the message from God came to different prophets according to the kind of followers or according to the kind of audience that particular prophet had. And so none of this literature is seen as the same for every prophet. Remember, we talked about no one size fits all. So no one explanation would fit every aspect of everything concerning this particular gift of prophecy and the same would do for each prophet and so safely also we can say that the prophet's roles varied in the times of old testament to the new testament and so let's look at the prophet's role in the old testament considering what we spoke thus far prophecy or the prophets came in the role of a counterweight to monarchy and culture meaning the ways of life that people led in the Old Testament times. A quote that best described this, and which I found was, uh, is written in the Anselm Academic Bible uh, Study Bible, written by two professors and doctors called as Dr. Osik and Dr. Hoppe. They wrote this concerning the 
profit's role in the Old Testament. They said the prophet's primary concern was with contemporary events within social and political contexts. They focused on public morality, social injustice, religious idolatry, and the proper use of power. They are not confined to only speaking of judgment and damnation, but also of encouragement, mercy, and a hopeful future. So let's uh, look at the 10 major features of prophetic literature that we find in the Old Testament. First feature is the prophet's call. Now, each of the prophets were called by God himself in a very different way and with different instructions from one to another. Like, for example, we read in Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10 in verse 7, uh, you know, where the Lord says to Jeremiah, go, speak for me. And Jeremiah says, no, I can't speak for you. I'm too young, he says. Then the Lord, then the Lord replied to Jeremiah in verse 7 and said, don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. So this was the prophet's call for each one was separate. Second feature of, uh, uh, of, a prophet, uh, of a prophetic literature we see is symbolic language was used in the prophecy or in the message that was given. For example, in Hosea 1, 6 to 7, we see, uh, you know, God telling Hosea, name your daughter Lo Ruhama which means not loved. And so here we see a symbolic language that is being used. The third feature that we can see is not only symbolic language, but also sometimes a, a, a prophet was told symbolic actions to be done so that those very actions also can speak to the people to whom this prophecy was given. Like for example, in Isaiah 21, uh, 1 to 6b, we see that God tells, uh, you know, uh, Isaiah, take off the burlap you have been wearing and remove your sandals. And Isaiah did as he was told and walked around naked and barefoot. And so sometimes the Lord also gives a prophet a symbolic action to do so that from that action too, the Lord can teach and Lord can, uh, you know, use that very message to reach out to the people. Fourth feature we see is the prophets and the prophecies were used in confronting kings. We see here in Jeremiah 36, 27 to 31, that they say to the king, you burned the scroll because it said the king of Babylon would destroy this land and empty it of people and animals. Now, this is what the Lord says about King Jehoiakim of Judah. And so here we see that the prophet is confronting the king in what they have done. The fifth feature we can note is that they were also counselors to kings. The prophets were also as counselors to kings. They gave advice and guidance from God, sometimes even contrary to the desires of the prophets themselves. Uh, we see this in 2 Samuel 7, 1 to 3. Prophet Nathan, you know, is uh, very happy initially that David is going to be the one who will build the temple of God. And so he says, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it for the Lord is with you. But then in verses 12 to 16, we see that God tells Nathan otherwise. He tells that, hey, David is not the one who will be building my house, but his son, King Solomon. Sixth feature that we can see is the prophet, prophets or the prophecies opposed social inequality. The book of Amos stands brilliantly out in this. In Amos 8, 4 to 6, we see a prophet Amos saying, listen to this. You who rob the poor and trample down the needy. So here we can see that the prophet is opposing the social inequality that was present in that time. Seventh feature that we can notice in the prophetic literature of, in the Old Testament is that they passed also judgments, the, including judgments on those who exploited the poor and the powerless in that time. Now, here we see Isaiah in chapter 10, verse 3, that he says, what will you do when I punish you? 
when I send disaster upon you from a distant land, to whom will you turn for help? Where will your treasures be safe? This is the Lord using this prophet to pass out a judgment on those very people who are exploiting the powerless and the poor. The eighth feature we see is sometimes the Lord gives messages directly as a way of oracles, right? In Isaiah 13, 1, Isaiah is the son of Amos, received this message concerning the destruction of Babylon. So there are sometimes directly they are given from the Lord himself. Feature number nine would be that the prophets and the prophecies are calling for obedience or repentance from the audience that the prophecy is meant for. In Ezekiel 18, uh, 32 verse, it says, the Lord says, I don't want you to die. Turn back and live. And so here we see the prophecies directly uh, pleading in a way, you know, telling the people to return back to obey the voice of the Lord. Feature number 10, we would see is they also give assurance of deliverance to their listeners or to us, the readers. In Isaiah 40, uh, verse four, uh, chapter 40, verse 12, we see who else has held the oceans in his hands? Who has measured of the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? This is what the prophet is saying, assuring that this mighty Lord who can do all of this still has got your back. And so the, some of the prophecies are also given as a assurance of deliverance to the listeners or to the readers. So an important note here again is when reading prophetic literature, Having a peak concept helps. So you will say, what is this peak concept, right? This peak concept is nothing but that. A prophecy may have multiple levels of fulfillment. If you look at this particular uh, diagram or a sheet for, you know, for lack of a better, look at the peaks as, as a prophecy, okay? So the prophet there would, uh, you know, maybe standing before a peak and seeing the top of the peak or the working of a prophecy that he was given to speak on behalf of God. But then he's only able to see that first peak or, and, uh, you know, or how the complete fulfillment, he's not able to see basically more than the first peak, what is beyond that? How does a complete fulfillment maybe be later accomplished by God himself. And sometimes these could happen twice or thrice over. For example, we read a very popular Christmas prophecy, isn't it? For unto us, a child is born. Now, when Isaiah speaks to the king of uh, Judah, who is Ahaz. And so he was facing the Syrian crisis at that time. And so he told him that a child born of a virgin, that child's uh, shoulders will have, the government will rest on that child's shoulders. And today when we read this, we know that prophecy was talking about Jesus. But this was a partial fulfillment of this prophecy as Jesus did come down to earth, born of a virgin. In that time, even though Ahaz's future, because of the enemies that he's seeing before him was bleak, God was assuring him through uh, the prophet, don't worry, I will raise somebody from your line and that, and I will ensure a victory for you. And of course, the complete fulfillment of this prophecy or the third time would take place when Jesus would return uh, fully, isn't it? When, in, when he will establish his kingdom in the fullness, right? Another example would be prophecies in the Old Testament that talk of judgments that were pronounced on the nations. Many of those nations we don't hear uh, anymore. But they had relevance in the past. And these were destroyed as a consequence of the sins against God. But those prophecies also have a relevance in the future concerning what we will await, you know, uh, in the, about the prophecies that are written in the book of Revelation. And so we can safely say by this peak concept that a prophecy can speak to the time you are living in as well as the immediate future or the far away future, even though a prophet would see only, you know, the first peak or the partial fulfillment sometimes of the prophecy that he has spoken on behalf of God. Like, for example, also Daniel, remember, he had messages that were to do with his time and also messages for the far, far future, which are yet to be fulfilled. And of course, we read them in the book of Revelation. Now, let's move on to the features of a prophet's role in the 
New Testament. Now, here we see in the New Testament and even now in this particular, uh, you know, the, after rather the church age and, and uh, so, we see the feature, the main feature is that Jesus is our ultimate prophet. He has revealed all that there is to be released, revealed. This is the reason, in fact, that we don't see much of this gift being operated nowadays. In Hebrew 1, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we say, But in these last days, he, that means God, has spoken to us by his Son. Now, Jesus spoke about the immediate future and also of the time that would come in the far, far away time, before even his second coming. And also, he spoke about what would come at the end of time itself. Because he is Alpha and Omega. And everything, everything that we know and don't know starts from him and ends with him. And so, uh, to, to, so we can safely say that to know Jesus is worth it all if we want to know about prophecy. You know, Revelation uh, 19th chapter, verse 10 in the AMP version puts it the best. It says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It means his life and teaching are the heart of prophecy. If you read other versions of the Bible, they say that Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He is our ultimate prophet and role model. We need to learn deeper about Jesus to understand all that there is about prophecy. And so these are in direct connection. If we know more about Jesus and his life and his teachings, well, we will also know and understand more about prophecies. At the same time, another feature of a prophet in the today's times or in the New Testament would be where all the people who have the spirit of God and who are born again can prophesy, sometimes knowingly and sometimes unknowingly, but as inspired by Jesus as inspired by the Holy Spirit. And yes, some of them do get fulfilled too, even in this days and age, but not all of them are called prophets. So there is a promise for us written in the book of Joel 2, 28, 29. Okay, so this promise that is given in Joel is seen fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 on the day of, can anyone guess? Pentecost. Pentecost, absolutely. And so... Peter again quotes this Joel 2 uh, prophecy and says that in verse 18, he says, On my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. So you see, there is a way that the Lord has made that the spirit of God will be poured out upon us and we too will prophesy, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, but not everyone will be called as prophets. And uh, of course, there'll be, uh, you know, there'll be many signs and wonders that will follow. But nevertheless, again, as we said, we are dividing the study in two parts. We will come to this part of how to discern which prophecy is real, true from God and not in a later part. Uh, the example of unknowingly prophesying would be um, Ananias, the high priest. Now, if you remember, Ananias spoke concerning the death of Jesus because of the position he held, not as a prophet, but as a high priest. In John 11, 50, when we read, we hear that, you know, uh, Ananias says, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. After verse 50, we get a commentary in verse 51, where it says, that he, that is Ananias, did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. Meaning, better that one man, Jesus, die for our sins than all the people dying for their sins in this nation of Israel. Now, this particular prophecy, it has relevance even today for us, isn't it? There's a second part of fulfillment here. It's the second peak. It, it, it is relevant even to us because Jesus paid the price for you and for me, for our sins, thereby redeeming us and making us part of his family. And so uh, we are at the, at, the, uh, at the end of our part one study, uh, but I want to leave you with a note for this week uh, that it is good.
to remember, no matter we have seen the features of the Old Testament of what is prophecy, how do prophets come about, what are the means of reception and all of this. But the purpose of Bible prophecy, whether it is foretelling or forthtelling, and all that we are studying today and learning is not to help us predict the future, but to help us know Jesus, the Lord of all history. Remember, he's the Alpha and the Omega. Everything starts with him and ends with him. And so we will come back to more of this in our part two study next Wednesday. I hope I'll see uh, all of you guys and more in that particular uh, part two. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we will carry on now more to um, the question and answer session. If any of you have any comments, uh, you can you can add. Uh, if you have queries, I will try my best to answer, which I do not know. I promise to learn myself first uh, as I have been edified through this study and will get back to you. And I'm sure the, pro the pastors right now in our midst also will help us answer those queries. Uh, but do remember, I'm putting the screen open uh, for, the, for what we have learned in the part one. And so I would uh, really be uh, appreciated if your uh, queries would be based on these things that we have uh, learned and studied today. So any questions, any um, comments that you have? Uh, I'm sorry, I have to jump in first <clears throat> just to get the get, just to get the juice flowing, I guess, for everyone to think. <laughs> but uh, uh, lots of information, Shanti, lots to process. <laughs> uh, I especially like those features uh, of uh, prophecy. I think that gives us a, a good a good information as that prophecy is not just uh, something, you know, limited to foretelling. And it is uh, that word, uh, that phrase you use, need-based, is very good. Uh, did I understand you correct when you said that uh, a sermon is also a type of prophecy? Could you explain that? Absolutely, Pastor Dan. So we see and we have uh, we have learned today about forth telling prophecies. Forth telling prophecy is looking at the circumstances that are around us. And with the God's given discernment and wisdom, people who have this gift are able to discern and from the circumstances that are there, they're able to speak on what is the Lord's guidance or the Lord's voice to people. And so sometimes what we speak from the pulpit can also be forth telling prophecies. And also we see sermons in the New Testament like Paul, you know, Paul went ahead and gave sermons. That is also New Testament prophetic literature. And so sermons are also one way or rather one kind of uh, forth telling prophecies. That is what I mean. I, mean. I hope I've answered your query, uh, Pastor Dan. Yes. Uh, yeah, I wanted that forth telling because sometimes we just get stuck on future, the future rather than what is necessary for us today. And sermons are one of those very important aspects of Christian living. Yeah, very good. I'll wait if anybody else is asking a question, otherwise I might come back again. Could Shanti clear her screen? Hi, Bertie. I'm having an issue with my camera. I'm so sorry that it's not in my hands to clean the camera uh, screen, but I hope I'm visible and I hope that uh, what I have uh, learned and uh, spoken here would have touched your heart and edified you. Yeah, thank you, Shanti. It Let me say that first, I'm very much, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, encouraged to just to see uh, all of you brothers and sisters here. It's my first time here in GCI leading a study. And so this is very encouraging for me personally. So thank you for being a blessing to me. Yes, Bertie, you had a question. Uh, it's just that I wanted to see all the faces to, to, uh, to check up on the interest they have in. <laughs> just a joke. <laughs> Can't, can't see the I other. think Bertie, we need to stop the screen share. 
Uh, maybe I can stop the you've seen the objectives that we've learned today. So based on this, I can I'll stop the screen share now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I hope Bertie now you can see all of us. Yeah, thank you, Shanti. Please feel free to ask any query that any of you have or a comment that you want to add. Something new maybe you have learned that you've not known before about prophecy. Mr. Nagar, you gave me a big smile. Would you like to add something to this so that I may also learn? Not really. I was just saying that I think you covered all the bases. So <clears throat> I don't think there was any um, any query or any confusion left, at least not in my mind. Except that, you know, that two points that you made, prophecy could be foretelling and forth telling. Because generally prophecy, people understand as only future predictions. But even as, as you said, preaching could be prophecy. As, as Paul says, the gift of prophecy, that doesn't naturally only mean predicting the future. It means, you know, preaching, edifying, encouraging. That also could be as part of prophecy. Yes. Absolutely. That, that In fact, we will study a little more about this in part two, where we will see the, what the purposes of a prophecy. Mr. Franklin. Hello, sir. Would you like to add a comment? Uh, you, are, you are on uh, mute. Mr. Franklin. Uh, now, now, can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. Excellent analysis. And uh, your time management also now, you are giving ample time for questions to be raised. We, we praise God, Mr. Franklin. Glory to the Lord. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Ma'am, if I can add one more, one more question, one more point. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, I think the the prophet Jeremiah, madam, is the only uh, prophet who has seen his own prophecies uh, being fulfilled uh, right in 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 his own presence. Yes, you Am could correct? you you, you could. Correct? You could say that, but there are there is so many facets to the prophetic literature, of especially Isaiah and uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. That you know, as I said, the peak concepts helped uh, me to understand. You know, these multiple levels of fulfillment. Uh, so I cannot say exactly agree with what you're saying because I would have to learn even more and come. But I'm sure the pastors in our midst would be having more information than me. In this particular, and they maybe perhaps they would like to answer this. No, madam. The point, a limited point I'm making is he predicted that Jerusalem will crumble like a deck of cards, and he has he himself has witnessed it with his own eyes. That is true. Well, let me ask another question. I'm not seeing anybody else. All our scholars are not saying much. <laughs> uh, Shadi, you mentioned about divination and uh, that the source of divination is not God. You also mentioned divination could have, the source could also be supernatural, which means to say it could be demoniacal, satanic, so a question might pop in our minds, can demons or Satan predict the future? A very interesting question, Pastor Dan. And, uh, you know, the Bible, uh, it's, it's written in the Bible that there are principalities and powers. So they're not powerless. 
these supernatural powers that you know beside god god is all powerful but at the same time these uh, uh, you know fallen angels or the or the the demons that we have under satan they do have power of some kind it's not that they are powerless and this is why they are able to do the harm that they can in our lives actually they're able to disrupt they're able to you know take us away from god keep fires from god you know even despite our best uh, uh, of efforts sometimes and this is why you know we need the lord uh, to to be closer to him to to remain uh, in his will and so uh, definitely we meet we need to be aware that there are powers that are beyond our understanding and this is why also we need to test and discern every spirit isn't it that's what the bible says and so very much divin diviners or truth sayers and fortune tellers some of the things that they say do come uh, do uh, come about correctly you know but the source is not god um and but we must be aware because as i said there are always caveats attached many of them require uh, something from you they require money from you they require sometimes even blood sacrifices uh, and things like that dangerous stuff and that's dangerous territory for us as born again believers and so we must adhere to uh, following prophecies or messages from god that are inspired from god within the context of his word that has been revealed to us in jesus Pastor Praveen, Pastor Sachin. Can I come in, Shanti? Uh, yes, buddy. Uh, uh, the Bible speaks, uh, and Zechariah said, as you say, it's clearly uh, the Bible takes a very negative view of it uh, about diviners. And it's mentioned in a particular scripture where God says, he makes diviners mad. And so... Uh, as you say, the source, supernatural uh, source, but not from God. And uh, uh, the Bible is again, the Bible speaks negatively and God also attests to the fact that it should not be done by his people. You know, go for these things. Yes, buddy. Anyone else would like to add a comment or? Elsie. Mr. Surya Murthy. We always get very, um, uh, very interesting queries from Mr. Surya Murthy. I'm waiting to hear one on my in my turn. And I hope I'll be able to answer your query as you asked me at the start, uh, Mr. Surya Murthy. No, nothing. Thank you. <laughs> I have a query or probably a question. But, uh, everyone can take a take a chance to to answer or cl clarify. And this is on the uh, about this is about fourth telling, which is seeing today's I mean, current circumstances and then trying to predict the future or seeing how the future would be. And I, I have seen it or witnessed it suddenly when we had uh, recently in the in the Philistine when the Hamas uh, terrorist organization had attacked um, Israel, and the and the war erupted, and the clashes that happened, people started opening Bible, putting the pen together, opening the CNN and news together, and I remember talking with one close friend of mine. Okay, what are you doing? No, this is a time to uh, check the prophecies will come true. So, uh, is there something that uh, if it's not done properly, we can uh, assess it wrongly in the sense or we probably would lead ourselves to a wrong direction if we don't do this foretelling properly? <coughs> yes, thank you for the question. Uh, definitely, you know, the, I think, uh, again, this, this will come under, uh, into our next part, actually, it will help us more to understand this. Um, as, as very rightly put, forth telling, if the interpretation is not done the right way, we could fall into the, uh, the, the pit of, you know, uh, interpreting 
God's message itself in a wrong way. And so our direction would become an error. Our thinking would become an error. And instead of going towards God, we would, we could actually step, you know, take two steps back. And so we must be very aware of this. And uh, we always need to test and validate any prophecy that is given, even if it is forthtelling, even when if it is foretelling. And so... Um, I think all those people who are, you know, who are thinking about, uh, okay, this is going to happen, that is going to happen. And they, if they made plans, depending on their discernment, then there is a question of what is the context? What is the uh, validation of this? Where is the confirmation through the spirit? And of course, all of these, again, are going to come in a part to study. But a thing to remember for today is we have to be very careful when it comes to this particular gift and its interpretation as well. Uh, perhaps Pastor Dan and uh, the others can add uh, to this. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, pro prophecy by its very nature is, uh, most of the time is, is, little vague. It, it doesn't pinpoint exactly the day, time and events and stuff like that. And the danger is that, of course, we being wiser from hindsight, we try and fit whatever was said by the so-called prophet or the actual prophet that, look, this is how this is where it happened, where it may not have been that fulfillment. And of course, then there is a catch all phrase that, oh, this is ultimately going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So, you know, uh, there is always this danger where one person says, yes, this is this is it. The other says, no, this is going to be. So how do you resolve that? You know what I'm saying? Yes, I, I, I heard you. I will try and answer that, but I request the pastors and the others to, to add to, to, to my answer. <laughs> uh, very truly, as you said, uh, you know, it's it's difficult. Uh, to do what uh, is expected, as you said. Um, but let me put it this way. Um, give me a moment to think about it. Maybe uh, I will let Pastor Dan or others take this up and I will get to you. Is that okay? I'll just give me a few seconds to think about this. Sure, sure. <clears throat> I think, uh, Shanti, you mentioned that uh, some of these things may have clarity or bring will bring clarity when you do your next uh, study. Uh, so perhaps we can wait until that. But uh, Anil, were you referring to the fact that uh, in in biblical prophecy there is, it is not specific uh, in terms of dates and uh, events or or people? Is that what we you were asking? Uh, broadly, yes. Broadly, yes. Not not just the dates, even the events and so on, sometimes we, you know, try and forcefully fit it that this prophecy relates to this, whereas actually it may not be, but how do we, how do we know that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is very true. I mean, uh, people try to force things into prophecy. Right. And we are now hearing one happening in your own country, that a certain man has been prophesied to be the president. Correct. Yeah, he is sent from God. <laughs> Jokes aside, um, you know, many times the Bible itself explains the prophecy. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Daniel's prophecy was explained about how these kingdoms will come, mm -hmm. right? And some of the prophecies became much more clearer in the New Testament. And like I think even Shanti said. Most of the prophecy is about the coming of the Messiah. And in Jesus, all of it has been fulfilled. So that is very, very specific. right? Now, we would like to know events of the future, but I don't think the Bible makes that very clear. But what is clear is what the Bible itself explains. Um, you know, uh, and ultimately... The Messiah in Jesus Christ is the ultimate specific prophecy fulfilled, right? And of course, we know there is a second coming, but obviously we don't know the date. I don't know. That's all I can offer at the moment. <laughs> Maybe we can. Yeah. 
I think God's truth is always takes us by surprise. And unless God makes it plain, I don't think we should tread we should tread softly. Because we do excuse me. Because we don't really know what God is trying to say unless He tells us clearly. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly right, uh, Rekha. God has to explain to us, otherwise we uh, don't have the intellect to. to... Yes, I think Surya Murthy has a comment. Mm -hmm. Mr. Daniel Zechariah was mentioning about the Old Testament prophecies talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. And when we read New Testament, it is very clear that most, almost all the common people who have read the Old Testament, they were knowing. The scriptures are saying that Jesus Christ, a Messiah, is going to come. Even the common people were aware. But today, when you read the English translations of the Old Testament, you nowhere, nowhere, very rarely see that. Uh, I'll give you the answer for that. The answer is because of the translations are done wrongly. The Hebrew translations from to English is done wrongly. If it is uh, if the Translations are done rightly. What I will say will be clear. The common people were knowing. The scriptures were talking about the Messiah coming. But today when you when you read the English Bibles, it is not clear. It is not occurring frequently. Thank you for the comment, Mr. Surimurti. Yes, uh, Bhati. Uh, could, we, could we say we are in the Laodicean era of God's church? At present, are we the Laodicean church? Okay. I will be honest and tell you, Bertie, I do not, I've not heard that word before. I will yeah. honestly submit and tell you oh, I have that. not heard of it. But I shall learn and get back to you on this. No, but perhaps seven, those who know can help with that word. The Spirit speaks to the seven churches in the Revelation in the beginning with uh, uh, the, the Laodicean church. church. Okay. That's just the Laodicean Thank church. You. Why, why okay. I'm saying that? Because it doesn't, uh, I mean, uh, doesn't give a very, it doesn't sp speak very positively about the Laodicean church, stating that it's a lukewarm church and uh, we should, you know, uh, watch out, we should because other places we Christians have to be diligent, we Christians have to be watchful and praying and you know, uh, walking with the Lord and uh, conforming to the Lord, the Holy Spirit is at work, we all are work in progress but the, the what the what the church mentions uh, the, in the Laodicean, or the Laodicean church uh, is uh, like a, it speaks negatively where God says that uh, uh, take, take heed, you know, and uh, uh Find your first love, first love when you when you came to know Christ. You know, all of us had the flush of you know what you call enthusiasm and the love for Christ, and you know we were we were so you know overjoyed and other things in the first flush of uh, you know knowing uh, at the start of our calling, at the beginning of our calling and coming into Christ. But Laodiceans uh, also, I think I think it's the Laodicean God addresses where it says. Uh, you know, remember your first love, you know, for the church, you know, when you came to know me. And uh, I thought I'll just mention that, that uh, we should all be, you know, growing, knowing and growing. And I think Bible study is a very helpful thing <laughs> for us all. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Nagar, I wanted to get back to you on that. Uh, so, as you said very rightly, you know, sometimes the Lord gives prophecies uh, in a much broader, generic way because He He it is for all the people. It is for all the people. The audience was different. But now, in today's time, we are on this side of the cross. And as we said, Jesus has revealed all that there is to be revealed. And from His word, we can actually take His message for our life. 
as a person to person. And so there is definitely we need to watch out for anybody who's coming and saying, hey, the Lord told me about you. You know, when people start off that way, then there is we need to be very wary of it. And of course, when it comes to the Lord, we always uh, need to, you know, um, uh, be very careful and be extra cautious in trying and discerning what is the context that it's been said, what is a, is there confirmation about it from the Lord himself and from the Holy Spirit and uh, many other things, which we will, of course, talk about. Uh, perhaps your question actually, as Pastor Dana said, uh, next week, when we do about, uh, you know, the prophecy, the purpose and, and how to validate and how to test and interpret, um, I think this would be answer. But I very much agree with you. Anybody saying, the Lord told me to tell you, I think we need to be wary and a little cautious about it. So one more question, which again, we can take it up next. That, uh, we say that prophecies basically are all pointing to Christ and they all find its fulfillment in Christ. But that is that really true? I'd like you to reflect on that. Because there are so many prophecies probably which have nothing to do with Christ. They are just describing physical events in the future. So how does that really gel with this? I'd like to understand that. That's a loaded question. It's uh -huh. a huge answer. Um, believe me, when I was preparing for this, uh, I, mm -hmm. I I learned a lot uh, through the preparation of this. And uh, uh, Maybe I can be upfront and tell you this this week and say that he is, as we, we have we've known always, he is the alpha and the omega. Everything starts and ends with him. So even if something doesn't exactly pertain, you think, we think rather, that it doesn't pertain to Jesus, please do know that it will, it is pertaining to, you know, even at the very end of time. He has revealed everything that there is to be revealed, even of those things which we think that they do not connect or point to Jesus. Prophecy is all about pointing to Christ and everything from Christ and everything in Christ. And so, as I said, the, the multiple, the peak concept. So a few of those things, you know, when we think, you know, one, this thing later on, they seem as if they're not connected, but later on we get to see the, the fulfillment of it in Christ. So I, I will say, we'll do the study again. And, uh, uh, you know, perhaps I'll be able to give you a little more deeper, uh, uh, you know, um, comment for you, uh, you know, from the understanding that I have had. And of course, we have our pastors and our elders here who will contribute to this, I'm sure. Yes. Another you. point, Shanti. Yes. Uh, uh, can we be correct? And Can you hear me, Shanti? Yes, Bertie. I, uh, just the last point. Uh, uh, can we be correct in uh, like uh, like saying stating that uh, prophecy is general uh, are, are, are on a hopeful note or on an encouraging note rather than you know being dire dire like you know and uh, uh, about you know very like serious and very wrong you know something very uh, destruction destructive or I'm saying in on the whole. Uh, can we say that as uh, prophecy, particularly for us who are believers, who are trusting the Lord and honoring our God and walking in truth, uh, uh, prophecies, are, uh, could we say it's hopeful, uh, hopeful and encouraging to each of us? But uh, yeah. The prophecy yes, about the world tomorrow is encouraging. What, what we learned long ago. The yeah. prophecies about the world tomorrow. Yeah. So many prophecies. They are yes. interesting. Yeah. Are Hopefully. you both answering each other or are, are you <laughs> or do you want me to answer? I'm a little confused. Can you help me out, please? Well, Shanti is if I was to I if I was can... to take both of your things, I am I if I'm reading uh, or understanding your your comment and question, right, uh, Mr. Surimurti and Bertie, is is all prophecy dire, isn't it? Does it have a hopeful message or not? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, but uh, Shanti, I think we uh, it's past time. And uh, I think uh, I can just, uh, if I can humbly say, we can conclude and then you can leave Suramuthi and me, you know, on the screen, you know, talking to each other, our post, post conclusion. <laughs> I'm just, I'm Absolutely. just saying, we will have this question uh, in next week for sure. We'll take that up first. Next time, yeah.
Thank you, Shanti, for the wonderful uh, session teaching, and uh, it was quite interesting uh, discussion as well. Perhaps we'll close uh, uh, this evening's Bible study with a word of prayer. Uh, perhaps may I ask Mr. Anil to conclude with a prayer? All right. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> oh, great and almighty God in heaven, <clears throat> Father, we come before you humbly, acknowledging, Lord, that you're such a humongous and such an awesome God, Lord, and we can't even begin to understand you fully, Lord. Father, today we discuss prophecies, and we know, Lord, there are so many things that we still don't understand. But one thing is that prophecy is there in the Bible, and we need to understand. And as Shanti very well explained, Father, we are much wiser for this now. And we thank you, Lord, that we are able to gather like this and discuss your word and then thereby give you the glory for everything, Lord. Because, Lord, we really don't understand anything unless you reveal these to us. And so we are so very grateful that, Lord, you are revealing these to your people, to your pastors and to your elders, Father. And we continue to look forward to your messages as we go along. And, Lord, con please continue to bless your people, Lord. There are so many people at this time hurting. There are so many events going on around the world which we pray for and hope that all these things settle down and get sorted out amicably and peacefully because a lot of people are dying in this ceremony. And then we just pray for your mercy and your grace on your people, Lord, and continue to inspire us and give us understanding more and more. Thank you, Lord, for your pastors and your speakers. We pray for their well-being. We pray for the well-being of all of us, Lord. And now dismiss us and bring us back safely the next week when we again meet and give you the honor. Thank you, Lord. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for joining. And uh, once again, thank you, Shanti. We uh, definitely will be quite excited about the next session. <laughs> and yes. uh, we'll be again. God be with you and wish you all have a good night.